For those who don't know, BOM has been publishing conversations between artists since 1981. And we have a new podcast called Fuse. So we want you to check that out. That's on Apple Podcasts and wherever you listen. And we also boast an archive of interviews free to the public and on our site. So we want to mention Sigrid's from 1995. So revisit that after the show tonight. It's an excellent interview. Do subscribe to BOM and receive new fiction interviews and art in your home four times a year. And um, thank you for joining us tonight. You have a lot of choices in your life. We're glad you made this one. Um, also, if you're new to Zoom webinar, you're going to drop your questions down here in the question box. You can do that at any point tonight during the conversation. Um, and then Amy Bender will be selecting your questions and getting to them at the end of the conversation. You're also going to see a bookshop link go into the chat and that's where you'll be purchasing your books. We choose bookshop because they celebrate uh, small independent bookstores and everybody wins when that happens. So. I'm so happy tonight that we, this evening will be hosted by Amy Bender, the author of The Butterfly Lampshade. And I'm grateful to be in the room with Amy tonight, virtual room that is. Um, she was my teacher years ago and helped me to embrace the strangeness of my own work. And Amy's books do that line by line. And if you do not know her work already, I am jealous you get to discover her tonight. These two writers create sentences that illuminate the delicate humanity in us all and take apart our defenses. So now for bios. Amy Bender is the author of six books, The Butterfly Lampshade, The Girl in the Flammable Skirt, which was a New York Times notable book, Invisible Sign of My Own, which was an LA Times pick of the year, Willful Creatures, which was nominated by The Believer as one of the best books of the year, the Particular Sadness of Lemon Cake, which won the Skiba Award for Best Fiction and Alex Award, and The Color Master, a New York Times notable book for 2013. Her short fiction has, a, has been published in Granta, GQ, Harper's, Tin House, McSweeney's, The Paris Review, and more, as well as heard on This American Life and Selected Shorts. She lives in Los Angeles with her family and teaches creative writing at USC. Feel free to put a bunch of fun emojis in the chat right now and welcome Amy, who will be coming on soon. And our guest of honor, Sigurd Nunez is the author of the novel Salvation City for the Last of Her Kind, A Feather on the Breath of God for Rowena and the National Book Award winning The Friend, among others. She is also the author of Simfrey Susan, a memoir of Susan Sontag, and she has been a recipient of several awards, including a Whiting Award, the Rome Prize in Literature, a Berlin Prize Fellowship, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. Her work has been translated into 25 languages. Nunez lives in New York City. And when thinking about introducing Sigrid tonight, I thought, what a great idea just to lead with the epigraph in this beautiful book. Love of our neighbor and all of its fullness simply means being able to say to him, what are you going through? Simone Lee. So let's welcome Amy and Sigrid. Thank you, Libby. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Hello, Sigrid. And all right. So just getting orientation. There we go. So it's such a pleasure to be able to talk to you about this book and about your work, which I love so much. And, um, and I think, I mean, I have these various questions, but I think that the feeling is too that I feel what you write so deeply that I can sort of articulate questions and I've done my best to articulate questions, but it's, um, I think it's a, a credit to the work that it's not easy to boil things down into questions. So, you know, I'll do my, I'll, I'll muddle along and I think, I think it'll be fine, but I think um, it, it just, it, it has such a powerful way and this new book, you know, equally to the others. So. So I wanted to start with the idea of um, quality of attention, because I think, and this just shows up from page one in this book and, and in others too, that there's such care that um, your narrator puts on everything and that things are given, I think, an equal eye 
and dignity, like the paperback book on the side of the Airbnb gets time, the cat gets time, events get time, death of course gets time, friendship. The big issues are alongside the small things and the feeling in reading that, um, it feels like there's sort of a mirroring of our experience as people and that we're living alongside big things and small things and sort of carrying them in our minds all the time and that this narrator is showing us that through. So I guess um, there, there was a way too that I was thinking of it. It's like the anti-social media or the anti-phone where I feel like in the phone, you're always kind of scrolling to the next thing. And it's always like there's a ranking of things. And I feel like in your, in this book, there's this way of us taking our time. You're taking, you're taking us through things um, and, and everything gets a certain care. And so I was thinking about the idea of what does it mean to attend and the quality of attention. And just wondering if you could talk about that a little bit as, as a writer, is it the quality of attention that moves through the sentences? Is it something that you're aware of in observing the world? Um, just to start with this idea of, of attention and attending. Well, um, I guess, I guess I, I think that, that, uh, that writers actually do pay closer attention to other people, perhaps, than most people. Um, because it's really, because that's what we write about. We write about people in different situations. And there's a, there's a place in the book where, um, where the narrator is talking about being a, being a kid, being a, being a teenager. And this is something I remember very well, that um, the parents of your friends had, you know, because they had reached middle age, I mean, they had the parents and the grandparents had been through extraordinary life experiences. And some of them had amazing jobs, like working in, a, in an emergency room and um, uh, a, 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 being a police detective or just, you know, and, um, but you, as a, as a young person, you would, you would never ask them about that, nor would you ever, nor would you ever think that they would be worth listening to really about talking about their lives and their feelings. All you cared about was what your friends were doing and thinking. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's strange because you know, like your girlfriends who, you know, we, we, we'd be talking about, you know, uh, uh, makeup and hair or something like that. And that even though none of us had experiences that were all that different from, from, from our own, that was fascinating. And there's, there's, there's no way that someone who had been through World War II um, could could really be of any interest, and I, I, I that just struck me as very strange. And in the same, I mean, it's common, but nevertheless, it's strange. And it, and uh, and in the same section, I write about how, um, you know, the narrator says that she she believes that uh, that there actually really are no boring people, really, and there are no boring lives if you really listen to the person, but sometimes you might have to listen for a really long time. And I could add, and you could hear all kinds of things that you really don't want to hear. But that kind of sustained attention for me, I gave that quality to the narrator because I had this, you know, I mean, I, I had this idea, this, um, this, this what, what Simone Weil had said, and which I made the epigraph of the book about, you know, about what are you going through? What does that really mean? That means, uh, tell me what you're going through. I'm, I'm you know, the, uh, I'm, I'm listening. I mean, another way to put it would be, um, you, know, uh, you know, talk to me, something mm -hmm. that, you know, anybody wants to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is true that, you know, in our everyday life, our attention is, 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 is torn this way and that in so, in so many, you know, different directions. But, e but even without that, I mean, I think even before all that, um, I think that the, the, the idea of really listening to somebody and getting them to talk, um, you know, was, was to some extent not, you know, not, is, is not encouraged. I mean, you know, uh, it's, it, you, you know, why do you, it's not your business, you know what I mean? Like you, you, you know, to, to people think that they, you know, that they're, that it, that they're, that they shouldn't be talking about themselves and what they're going through. That really is, you know, um, people think, well, I'm not your therapist. 
that's that's the kind of thing you would you know you you should be you should be in therapy you should be telling your therapist that or you know so anyway so that was just interesting to me and then i thought from the beginning of, of the book that it would be about a series of encounters that the narrator had with people as you say it's some you know and going through big and small things um and even the cat has a story to tell about what it has been through a story that has a happy ending um and i just you know i but i did eventually want to focus on somebody who was going through the biggest thing which is which is serious illness and dying um but i i i just you know that that really was an idea about about uh, uh somebody who would listen without you know it, to some extent that the, the, it's not like the narrator has any advice for anybody you, if you know right. what I mean yeah which is so refreshing too you know but that there's a I think it's it's that there's this biggest thing and there's a central um relationship and uh experience in the book but I think it felt really important to me that that is surrounded by attention to these other things too like they they have to exist together and it, and I feel like they do like that there is that that watching a Buster Keaton movie in the middle of great large issues is is how we live our lives and I, something is really replicated there that feels really important I think about um, what it's actually like to be a person living through big things a lot it just they're never separate right they're always together and so um it's fine i find that very uh soothing in some way and i think it's because i know um and i love rachel cusk and i love her books and i know because she has a certain kind of listening in her books that i that i know that some occasionally people will draw comparisons but i think there is a there is a, a real difference in that the the scope is different like the scope of listening can include the cat and it can include sort of paying attention to it's it's applied to people but it's also applied to walking down a street and what are the you know where's the wine bar where, where is it changed from here to there and that feels um like it's just the the viewfinder is a little larger in that way or the scope is different and that way it feels um specifically uh the kind of listening that that comes from your work and some of it, uh, some of the listening is really, is eavesdropping for one mm -hmm. thing, but also um, it's not as if this narrator were, were thinking, I'm going to be kind, I'm going to be open, I'm going to be helpful. Tell me, what are you going through? I mean, in a lot of, um, you know, in, in, in a number of cases with the encounters, uh, she's stuck she's she does she's there she doesn't have a choice she would have to be terribly rude and awful and she won't do that but she i also see this narrator as a, as as kind of incompetent in a way mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. sense that that um you know p people start talking about their troubles or w whatever it might be um and she doesn't have anything to offer but that attention mm -hmm. She she doesn't have advice. She doesn't she she you know she doesn't know how to fix anything, mm. um, but she can she can do that. And I I think it, if for for a certain part of the book, she does it because she doesn't know how not to do it. Because mm. she's there in the locker room and the woman starts speaking and okay, so she listens instead of instead of saying I have to run. All right, right. right. But but as the book goes on, um, you know she she becomes a much more important listener and and friend um to her friend uh but even there she says yes i will i will i will i will be with you through your ordeal again because she doesn't she doesn't she doesn't really want to do it she just doesn't know how to say no and then once they're in the house together once they are together and she said yes she 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 thinks of going back on her word and then she also um she also uh, um you know she goes into denial and th she thinks oh this will all turn out okay right you know the, the worst is not going to happen here so, yeah, and yet, so yeah, i mean she also though there's a moment when she says and it's so moving about how she realizes that there's really nowhere else she would rather be that once she has settled into this most intense um relationship 
I guess I, part of me felt like when she said yes, she had some sense that there might be something deeply meaningful in this experience. Be I guess because, I mean, maybe it was coincidental, but that there is a, there is a feeling at some point of um, this is actually really where I want to be. So that ambivalence Absolutely. shifts dramatically. Absolutely. And also at a certain point, um, she realizes that it's a privilege yeah. to, be, to be in the position she's in. Yeah. Uh, and, and the intensity of it. And yeah, it's, it's, I mean, uh, there's no explanation given for why she realizes that she wouldn't want to have missed this for anything. And that it, this, mo this saddest time is also one of the happiest times of her life. None of that was expected. Yeah. And also that her friend keeps talking and talking. These are, these are, you know, these, she's dying and she, and she, it talks about all kinds of things and says things like, I'm sick of hearing my own voice. You must be sick of hearing me. She's and the narrative, she's not, she gets increasingly um, riveted by this to the degree that she almost thinks there might be something uh, obscene about it, that she's, you know, that she, that she's so interested in, in what this woman is saying. Well, I was thinking about it today and I was thinking, cause in the middle there's this in this, the friend is on this podcast and they're talking about what gives life meaning and she quotes Kafka and she says, you know, what gives life meaning is that it ends and she sort of laughs. But that's exactly, like, I feel like the book is, is proving that in this kind of extraordinary way in that um, it feels to me like there's something about the presence of, um, of death and of, awareness of death which is so hard to tolerate but it's just in their face right it's in both of their faces that creates this space for this incredible intimacy and and so i feel like kafka you know it, it has a different tone than i think the way we think of a kafka quote but i also feel like it's completely in line with with the kafka quote and so um yeah so that's why i completely bought her being riveted it felt like the speaking of quality of attention, like everything is heightened because some of the maybe basic denials we carry around to live our lives were stripped away. Well, and also it's, uh, you know, it's, she's in this situation and they are in a kind of lockdown. You right. know? They're right. in the house together. They're not, uh, they're not seeing anyone else. People don't even know where they are. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I imagine the narrator watching this day to day, day to day, and thinking, so this is what, this is what it's like to die. Yeah. This, this is what it means. This is what happens to you. This is, and this is also, this, this will be me. This is not just all about this other. This is about all of us. This is the thing that unites us all. And of course, she might have known that to some extent. You know, but she now she was living it. Um, it's not that this woman was the first person in her life who's dying. She mentions losing her father and so on. But there's something about about the uh, the intimacy of sharing this experience, um, and and having it. You know, um, you know, it, having it be uh, the the um, the idea that it's where she comes to the the idea that you know watching someone die has the same kind of intensity as falling in love with someone yeah there it reminds me actually there's this incredible passage in maggie nelson's the argonauts where her partner harry talks about being with his mother when she's dying and the surrender that was also kind of tied in the book that to this idea of falling in love and how you know it's just so moving and and him watching her it's just very powerful so that just flashed through my mind too of that kind of I, i've uh, read it yes i uh, i agree i've read it and i i know what you're talking about yeah. yeah it's really an incredible passage um uh so then related to that too i was thinking because um there's this Inger Christensen quote that I sort of, I like had to stare at for a little while towards the end about, I mean, I, I can read it, but I sort of feel like it's nice for readers to discover those too. I don't wanna, <laughs> I don't wanna do, but, but let me just like, because it, I think it clarified to this idea of like, I've always struggled with epigraph and epitaph and how close they are. And it, like, I had to really <laughs> drill that into my head. 
But I think there's something about the book and something about the quote and this idea of what a novel is and what a life is that start to get aligned in a certain way that I think is very powerful in terms of how do we think about um, the act of writing and the act of living and in what ways are they very different and in what ways are they intertwined? And, and that it feels like in the, there's, I, yeah, we all know we're gonna die. And then this book is a book contending with it, but it's contained inside the covers of the book, but it's trying to contend with this idea of our humanity. So I guess I wondered if you could talk about a little bit of just, and it, just in general, how, how do those things, how does a novel mirror life? Is it, you also talk, um, the narrator says something about wanting to read books in terms of how they're written, like the way I have it written down here, but the, the way they write is more important whatever th than whatever they may write about, that there's something about the presence of the language that can affect our feeling as we live. So I guess I would love to hear you talk a little bit about the relationship between these two things. Well, I think there's a there's a there's a huge uh, struggle because you know language is the writer's thing, and the writer is supposed to be good at language and adept and f be able to find the right words. I mean, every once in a while, um, uh, you know, one of my students will write something and then uh, just then say it was indescribable. Right. And I say, you know, that's the one thing you can't say. You can't say to the reader, I couldn't describe it. You're a writer. You're supposed to describe it. If you can't describe it, you can't write it. Um, but, the, but the thing is that, that, uh, that what's frustrating for the narrator and, and for her friend, um, who's also a writer, is that, um, uh, that we don't, you know, that, 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 that we don't have the, the language, you know, the language doesn't match the intensity, the language never lives up to the experience. And that's, you know, that's particularly frustrating. Um, if you are, if you are a writer, because it's about failure. Um, and so, you know, this idea that you, that you, uh, you, you, you work and work and work it to get the sentences right. And then, you know, very often the writer does in the, in the work. But as far as what to say when, 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 when everything is at stake, uh, when somebody is really suffering, um, that just, we just don't seem to do that very well. And, um, and, and you know, when somebody is, is, is dying, certainly, but also when somebody is mourning, you know, the, the, how, how to console someone who's grieving, how to, how to, um, you know, ease somebody's suffering, um, you know, you, you, you just become inarticulate. And, uh, uh, you know, and that's why I, I, I mentioned the, 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 this, you know, rather famous letter that Henry James, who was very, very, very good with words, mm -hmm. uh, wrote to his friend Grace Norton, um, trying to console her and, 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 you know, even he begins his letter, I hardly know what to say. And then he writes this extremely beautiful letter. But, you know, that's the first thing. What am I going to say? So for a writer, it's like, well, if you, if you can't come up with anything. Um, and so, yeah, so that, so, so for me, there, there's, there's that. And then also, um, since you, you, you mentioned, uh, Inger Christensen, yeah, this idea that, uh, you know, this is also a kind of, I mean, it's, it's both thrilling and frightening that, you know, that, uh, that every work that is written could have been written differently, mm -hmm. um, but only after it's been written, just as every life could have been lived differently, but only after it's lived. I mean, I, that, that's just such a, such a, such a wonderful idea. Um, yeah. So yeah, so the the failure and also not just the fit, not not just that you don't come up with the right words in the most important situations, um, but that everything is you know that that whatever you do come up with is is a cliche, is hackneyed, and is always you know to some extent to the side of what you really want to be saying, um, and and how language falsifies everything. All of that becomes you know a really important part of of her experience with this woman. And in fact, as things go, it's the, as as things go on, um, they find that they don't they stop talking very much. And not because they're sick of each other or don't have anything to say, but they don't need to anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, they they've gotten to such an intimacy that just a, a look or a touch or whatever something in the air 
it, you know, creates the communication that they need. And so then they're not, they're not so frustrated, frustrated anymore about not, not, I mean, the friend doesn't know what to say about the fact that she's dying and uh, the narrator doesn't know what to say to the, to the friend and often will say is uh, something, something clumsy and get snapped at. Um, and there's that third moment where they're sitting outside and I'm just remembering a line where it says touch is so important in italics, I believe, where you can sort of feel that sense of the unspoken types of communication and there's sunlight on their feet and just that, that sense of togetherness made by language, but really about a space that is not spoken, that is quiet. Quiet and um, peaceful. And, so uh, and, and in fact, that, that that line happens twice because there's a, you know, and this is so interesting now because we're not, we're not able to touch one another. But I was certainly not thinking of COVID at this time because I wrote the book before that. However, she goes, she goes to, to work with a trainer at a gym. Right. Uh, whom she right. doesn't know. And um, he says that the, that the, the manager won't allow trainers to touch um, gym members anymore and he says it's kind of frustrating because it's hard to you know correct somebody without touching them but then she she starts thinking of her friend and she starts to cry and he wants to comfort her and uh, he can't touch her and then eventually he 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 does um, you know and he he has said to her touch is so important when you're a trainer and later she remembers this, um, you know, he, you know, he, this, this, this wonderful young man who, who risks his job in the parking lot, looking over his shoulder to make sure the manager doesn't see, but he said, I couldn't let you go without giving you, without giving you a hug. And, you know, when I think about that now with all that we're going through, it's, it's, it's really quite poignant. Yeah, right. Exactly. How many instances of that are happening constantly? Touch is so important. It's so important. Yeah. It's so important. Um, well, and in thinking of that, um, too, there, I'm remembering you're saying how they're not speaking, but also there's something really wonderful where the friend who is dying for a while can't read, and then the desire to read returns. And there's certain art forms they both at the moment are not interested in classical music, which has been a solace to them in the past. And there's some way that it feels like art and our relationship to art and when it can help, which art forms reach us at different times is really spelled out in a way that I think it feels very true and interesting. And I wondered if you could just talk about that a little bit about the way, like how, and, and even in this time now, right? How are people leaning on what arts and what do we need? Um, because it feels like it, different things at different times in our life sort of show up like, and mentioning Buster Keaton again, like somehow Buster Keaton is, is just right at that moment. Like is, you know, clicks, like is really just what they needed and, and something else isn't. And, and what is that relationship? Cause I feel like in some ways it's also the reader and the book too. Like we're, I, I feel like this is a book that is very helpful for me to read before this crazy election, right? I need this pace and I need this acknowledgement of grief. Like it feels very helpful to go into a book like yours right now? You know, I think helpful in general, but maybe particularly uh, good right now in terms of a contrast, right? So I'm wondering what, what about that? Well, the, um I, the, 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 both, well, the, the, the friend in particular, um, once she gets sick and, and her, her uh, life becomes all about dying, she finds that she, she can't read anymore because she has very bad concentration. Part of that is also from her when she's, you know, uh, uh, in chemotherapy, right. but she finds that, you know, she loved pop music and she doesn't like pop music anymore because the lyrics always seem so inane. She never had that problem before. <laughs> Classical music is just too moving. It's just right. it's too much. She says, right. I mean, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> Right, overwhelmed. <laughs> Relax, Beethoven, and and you know, and and um, and she, you know, uh, she does discover something that that I, from what I can tell, a lot of people have during this um this time of the pandemic, uh, have also discovered is that, uh, that they that that what works for them is to be in nature, 
I mean, mm. even if, it's, if it's just a park, I mean, uh, it, you know, that, that, that is still there. That is still nourishing. Um, the bird song doesn't irritate her. The, the going, you know, they, they're near a nature preserve and she, she will get up on her own in the morning and go walk there. And, you know, and she says, you know, they'll, they'll be bird song in heaven if heaven exists. Um, so that I think, yeah, I think, I think, you know, that, that made sense to me that, 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 there would be more comfort perhaps uh mm -hmm. in being in nature th than in any art artwork yeah um, yeah 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 and maybe this right into the and into the world of the natural and the connected to another human like that there's something about this what's happening right now that feels so key it makes me think too of the ex and his speech about climate and nature what we're doing to nature and the presence of that too. But I also loved how any sort of giant issue was also funneled through the subjective point of view of a person that it wasn't, we all, we know that the horrors of our fears about the planet, but it also felt like it was about this particular person and their relationship as well. Well, and there's also the feeling which I, 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 I found easy to imagine that she would have where, um, you know, she talks about reading novels and that she keeps feeling she's not enjoying it anymore. She used to love to read novels. Now she picks up a novel she tries to read and she finds herself asking, why are you telling me this? Mm. You know, not, it just doesn't seem important enough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, although, you know, when she's read two, uh, you know, this, this mystery novel that, that entertains her, but then, you know, what they discover, what really works as far as literature goes is this great big fat book of fairy and folk tales that they I find in the that. house. Um, and that, that somehow, um, that, that works, that, that works for them. Yeah. I loved seeing that. And I, lo I was looking to, there's this wonderful, line about uh, I looked out the window and the monster was still there and I thought of that with the folk tales late like it just felt like there's something about the sort of metaphors and symbols of folk and fairy tales which are some of my very favorites too that feel very useful they just feel you know like how many times have I yeah they feel real that's the thing about fairy yeah. tales. they're real and they can help there's something about the storyline that can help me think through things that are not at all, you know, of that world. Um, I, one more question in terms of form. One of the, th so often sometimes the moments that I would just be sort of so moved are the moments also where you, you leave a gap, the things you don't say, the things you leave out, what you choose. And, and I was thinking of Nick Flynn, the poet and memoirist, he once said at a talk, and it's always stuck with me that, um, he loves art that moves like a poem, even when it's not a poem. So film, novels, you know, obviously poetry, but other things where I feel like what he was implying is that where there's a certain space for those gaps. And I guess I just wonder in terms of the writing process, how do you choose what to leave out? It feels, um, is that something where you'll cut away? Is it something that you kind of feel your way to the end of a scene? They're just, it, it happens over and over again that something we think that we're gonna find out more and then you'll, you'll let the white space do that work. And it's very emotionally affecting, I think. Well, you know, if, if, you, if you're writing a, a traditional novel or a, a, a realist novel, um, you, you cannot get away uh, with not putting in that connective tissue, because if you don't have it there, it's not going to feel real. Mm. Um, but there's another kind of fiction. There's another kind of novel, or uh, where uh, where it's you know it, there it's essayistic, or part where you uh, where there's room for you know this literary thinking, as Javier Marias calls it, like where you know there you have a story of some kind, you have characters, um, but you make room to stop for some kind of digression or mm -hmm. meditation or reflection, and those parts are essayistic. Um, 
now you, of course you could you could have a great big fat realist novel full of uh, literary thinking in fact you know victorian novels are are, are full of it but um but i i do, i i agree with nick flynn about this idea of 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 um of, of trying to you know a certain kind of uh novel that 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 wants to go more in the direction of, of poetry than traditional novel um you know where you I mean, there's even a place, and I thought, well, am I going to get away with this, or is somebody going to say, ha, you, that's what you think, um, <laughs> where, where I, I have the two women together, and they're talking, the dialogue is happening, and then I say, oh, <laughs> I forgot, I forgot to set up the scene, mm -hmm. and that was like a kind of little private joke with myself, <laughs> they like, he said, sacred people, we think that they, they just fell out of the sky. I mean, what, what's going on here? You were there on, on the last page and now this dialogue is happening. And so then I say they were in a bar and it was right. a bar they used to hang right. out when they were in school. But, but, I, but it, was, it was a real moment for me because that, that was true. I, I, what I wrote, I forgot to set up the scene. Right. Um, and, um, but you know that, but I, I'm not really that interested in setting up the scene or uh, in describing, uh, uh, you know, the room that they're in or, 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 or lots of backstory. I mean, there's an important story about the friend and her relationship with her daughter, but we, but I don't really talk about the, the, um, the life of the narrator. Um, right. you know, it, she, she exists in this moment to be this person in relation to other people um i do say that she's taught um she is teaching but it happens to be summer at the moment but we don't know whether what kind of family she comes from or or um you know we just, and she has this this ex um yeah. but I, I i i want that i want i i i wanted to um you know i wanted to work on a small scale so that i could focus you know, I didn't want a lot of detail. I didn't want a lot going on. Uh, you know, I, I just, uh, I felt like I was, I was digging more than, you know, traveling, let's say. Yeah. Yeah. It feels like that. I mean, I think it's none of those questions ever came up in my mind of needing to know any of those things, right? Because it's, I mean, that goes to this point that the narrator makes about fiction that that lifts her up, that feels like it's how it's written. So there's something about this feeling of trusting that the information we're getting is what's needed. We're being told what needs to be told. Maybe it goes to that idea of why is this being told to me? Well, I'm gonna, I do, I trust this setup. Um, so we do have some questions, but maybe I'll try to sneak in one more before we, um, and I guess, well, I guess maybe this, just related to that a little bit in terms of writing. Um, like for example, in, when I was in grad school, a friend of mine said to me, just write what you're interested in and the writing will not be dutiful. And it was the most helpful writing advice I ever got because it was exactly what you're saying and that all the other stuff, there was no obligation to write anything that I wasn't interested in. And I think it, it feels true that then the language has life to it because you, the writer, are interested in it. So I guess I'm just curious about when you say you were sort of digging and um, how do you how do you know what to follow? What is your what is your instinct? How do you pick? Well, that's you know that's not so difficult for me for a very particular reason, which is that I I write you know. I write linearly. So I, you know, so I start with something, I might have different ideas in my head. Mm -hmm. um, but I just start somewhere. And in this particular case, I started with, I went to hear a man give a talk. Right. I didn't really, but so there was my narrator saying this, and then, you know, you, you put that down in another sentence and another sentence, and then you're, you're already um, obligated to, to the reader to, to explain what you're talking about, who's I, and where is she and what, what, what talk? And then you have to create the right. talk. What would the talk be about? <laughs> and so then given that I'm moving along like that, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's not a journal. It's not, it's not like a journal. It's not like recording um, what happened today. It isn't that, but it's like moving along thinking that literary thinking. So then uh, I get to a point and then I remember, I mean, there's this point where I'm talking about a movie that I saw um, this uh, Jesus, you know, and when I come to the end of that section, I remembered, oh, I remember when I was listening to the radio and I, I hear what, um, 
um, now his name is uh, his John Waters had said about it, and so, oh, and right, so right. I yeah. and, right, and how and how funny that was, and so you know, so I'll, I'll think of things, I'll remember something that I read which relates to what I'm writing about, and and then I'm able to put it in because I have that loose form, and because. I, you know, because, because you, you know that the narrator is thinking, right? She's not doing very much else. She's listening and she's thinking. So she records what other people say and she writes down what, what she observes and what she thinks about what she's seeing. And then the, the plot such as it is, it's so, it's so minimal that it doesn't really need fleshing out. But the fact that I go from, you know, to A, B, C, you know, just move along like that from the beginning of the story till the end, um, you know, that means that I don't have to plan. Right. You know, the, the structure that you're talking about, the structure is, is already there. And in this particular case, because I had already read the friend, written the friend, um, which is very close to this book. Yeah. They it felt almost like good. a yes, exactly. I mean, it's not a sequel, but it but it did come out of that. It did come yeah. out of the friends of this book. So they're um, they I mean they do they just feel linked. They feel connected in some way. Um, and it, I mean, just as a circling back, then it feels like there's a process of listening to one's own work, right? That you're seeing what gets on the page and then paying. And I felt that many times that the plot. And it, it is a, there is definitely a plot. It's just, a, it's just not, you know, it's not the plot of the paperback that you read. It's a very different, you know, you have opposite plots in that way. But that there's um, wonderful moments when things circle back that feel like they come from a paying attention to what's on the page, a kind of deep paying attention. Because I feel like we always leave clues in our work, but we don't know that they're there. And it's hard to pay attention to them because they sometimes are, are you know, quite subtly tucked. So I just felt that attention to the work again, um, similarly as to the things around, which is part of just the, the depth of the pleasure of the read. Um, okay, so it looks like, um, I think, oh, da, 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 I think I can ask one more. Nah. All right, well, let me, maybe I can fold in one from the audience and then I can fold in one of mine with the two. But we have from Raluca, Sigrid Nami, who are your artistic influences writers and otherwise? Well, you know, I, the people always ask this question and I, I uh, you know, I really believe that I'm influenced by, you know, by any good book I read, any good movie that I see. I mean, and there are just so many people, um, so many writers that I feel have fed into my writing, read, you know, writers, is, uh, you know, is, that are completely different from one another. And then there are these writers who are, tr who've been a tremendous influence, even though I don't write anything like them, like Virginia Woolf. Virginia Woolf is always there. I mean, Virginia Woolf, mm -hmm. for example, is a writer, um, I've read everything. You know, I've read, I've read all the novels, all the essays, all the letters, all the journals, mm -hmm. biographies. So obviously she, she's there, but yeah. I couldn't write more differently. Um, and then, um, you know, I studied with Elizabeth Hardwick, and yet I don't think that her influence came from those two undergraduate workshops that I, that I had. But she did write um, Sleepless Nights, which is a book that had, that had uh, uh, you know, that, 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 that has been an influence on my work. Mm -hmm. um, and an, and, and, and an influence on Sleepless Nights was Renata Adler, um, uh, Speedboat right. and Pitch Dog book, books that I absolutely adore and that I, I, I hope they've influenced me. <laughs> um, and, um, uh, and, then, and then also every book is different. So like for this book, Tom, the Austrian writer Thomas Bernhardt was actually a, a strong influence. For another book that I've, I've written for Rowanna, um, W.G. Zabold and V.S. Naipaul were very mm -hmm. strong influences. Mm -hmm. So it's really, it really, it really depends. Um, what about you, Amy? Um, I mean, also similarly that there's so much in it, and there's sort of like, it, it can be hard, like, can be hard to think of there. I think for my current book, there was, there's an epigraph to that book. That's a quote from the poet, uh, Wislava Samborska, and she has a poem called early hour. And it's about sort of waking up when catching it, the room in the moment before the things take shape. 
and trying to think of, I guess, childhood like that and that, that feeling. And it harkens back to, I think, what you were saying about being an adolescent and sort of they're all, there's all this resource around you and like you, you, were, you were aware of it because you can remember it now, but it wasn't registering enough that you could act upon it and thinking of all the things in childhood that we're taking in, but that don't have a shape yet and can't be articulated yet. And so I think um, her poetry isn't always about that, but there's certain moments where she's talking about the sort of naming of things and that space of thinking about things. She has one about um, it, the view of a grain of sand and she's talking about how sand doesn't call itself sand. And what are the things that like, what are the ways that we name things and shape things with language that are very much in the human experience, but that's separate from the world. Um, so I guess I think of her, um, for that. And I mean, I, yeah, but I think it relates to what you're saying that everything goes in. I just finished, um, Pamela Adlon's Better Things series on TV and it's just so funny and good. And so that also feels like that's on my mind. Like, you know, I read your book, which was so beautiful. I finished Better Things. Like all these things are sort of all these voices and all these different takes on the world. And when you feel like something is made and is, um, has this quality to it, um, it can't help but impact your work. All right, so Judy, just this week, a well-known editor of a literary journal said, he never wants to see another story from the point of view of a writer. You've already argued eloquently about what a writer narrator brings to a novel. Do you sympathize with this editor's frustration with writer narrators at all? Do you have thoughts for writers writing about writers? Interesting. Um, I don't know. I, I um you know the there's a there's a writer uh, the the, na the narrator of the friend is a is a writer and i remember when i was talking about that book i said um i never planned i i would never have said i'm going to write a book about a writer because that is frowned upon and then you know this editor the way he's speaking th this is this is what i'm talking about um you know it's people say, you know, you, you, you shouldn't do that, right? Um, however, as, my, as, my, as I was writing the book, the way the, right, the way the narrator saw the world, that narrator's consciousness was so obviously the, the mind of a writer. And the way she saw things was so obviously a writer that it would have been ridiculous not to not to uh, give in to that. It would have been, uh, you know, it, it 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 wouldn't have worked at all. But I certainly I I sympathize with it in this in the sense that I that I understand it. Um, I don't sympathize with the irritation. Yeah. You know, there's a lot to be irritated about out there. <laughs> this is really, you know, I would just say, you know, he says, but I I don't want another. So okay, well, you know, you don't want to close the book. There's plenty right. of other books. Don't read it then. You know. <laughs> <laughs> don't get irritated just exactly chill and it, it goes again to that this quote by the narrator about how a book is written which is like the content i think never matters like it just doesn't it doesn't it it seems to me such a um it's ultimately a ludicrous notion to be like a book in a, there shouldn't be a book about any particular topic because it's all about how it's written and how anything i think can be written about with depth well, but there's one, there's, but there's, there's one other thing about that, though. When people say that, um, I say, well, is, how many books are there about writers writing? I mean, there are a gazillion more books that aren't writers writing about writing. So this is just a small subset of books. So how can you be sick of it, if you know what I mean? I mean, the, the suggestion is that this is all anybody's doing anymore. Right. And I don't actually see that that's true. No. No, of um, course not. You know, so, yeah. No. Hmm. No. <laughs> I agree. We took um, care of that one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Done. <laughs> and so here's an, here's an interesting one um, from, oh my God, Matt Kay. Is it harder to maintain the loose essayistic prose style late into the novel when there might be an expectation to heighten the tension or to reach a narrative climax? I would argue that it, the tension actually does heighten. I mean, I'm gonna guess that because the book is just out, most people will not have had a chance to read it yet, but I think there, it, I will just jump in to say that I do feel like there is a shift 
even if there's that loose essayistic style, there's a, there is a tension build in that. We know there's a ticking clock. We know that the friend is dying. And that's very present in the second half of the book. Well, the, just because it's essayistic doesn't mean it's loose. Right. I mean, that's very important. I mean, in, in fact, it, uh, it, get, it, it, I mean, it, in fact, things get tighter and tighter, you, you know, um, but also, you know, it, it's, it, you're always writing for the reader. You're not just sitting around saying, I'll just please myself. I don't care what the reader thinks. I mean, that would be absurd. I mean, um, but you, you know, it, I, I don't usually think in that way that, uh, Oh, at this point in the book, the reader's expectations will be really what I think is I have a story here mm -hmm. and my duty is to the story mm -hmm. to make it convincing, to make it moving, to make it entertaining, to make it, you know, whatever, to engage the reader. And, you know, hopefully I have enough skill and enough sense to know that I have to do certain things you know, to meet, to, to meet readers' expectations in the sense of, 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 of wanting to hold their, their interest. Right. But I wouldn't think of it in terms of, oh no, instead of, um, instead of being essayistic, you know, that's, that's too loose, I should do something else. You know, it just, particularly moving towards the end of something. If you're moving towards the end of something, uh, you know, your options narrow. Mm -hmm. really you know you 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 just you have to you have to deliver about certain things that you've that that, that that you've already put down um and so i'm not trying to suggest that it writes itself but uh but but those are those are the expectations that you have to meet it makes me think there's a zadie smith essay where she talks about because she writes linearly as well and finishing a novel and she just like it's just building and building and then she went and sort of like it was this glorious hour where after she finished the novel and she just went and lay in a yard with like, you know, in my memory, I don't even know if this is in the essay, but like amongst a bunch of leaves and just the feeling. And I think because I don't write linearly, I don't know that feeling of like, I mean, I guess with a short story, but, but what is that like when you reach the end of a, of a novel? What is, what is that experience like? Um, yeah, um, you know, I think that there th that there is something like that always, like 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 a, a, a relief. It it is it is done, but then there is also a certain amount of loss. So some writer, some writer, I don't remember who it is, described it that it's like um, your novels are like your children, and then they go away to college. <laughs> So there's emptiness. Isn't that terrible pain in the ass? And you, you wish they weren't in your life, but then they go away to college and they're not there anymore. Um, so there's there's that kind of feeling. There's, there is a sense of loss. And in certain cases, if you become attached to the characters in a certain way, and you usually do, you do miss them. You miss the book and you miss the, the work that you, it, it's been your, it's been like a companion for like a couple of years. Yeah. It's been your job. And now, you know, you're, you're, you're liberated, but you, you also, mm -hmm. you know, you know that, and then you also have that, that feeling, which isn't the pleasantest feeling, which is now I have to start all over again. Right. right. Which is really not such a good feeling. Yeah. Are you writing, I'm sort of, I'm hoping that you're writing about quarantine. Like, I just would love to hear your take on that. So I'm hoping that's winding its way into your current work. Well, I ha I, I've, I've been writing some, some nonfiction since the mm -hmm. lockdown, but I, I have not had success. I did start to write, like so many other people I know, I did start to write something, fiction. Um, and it was third person, it was not first person, about, you know, about everything that we've been going through. Um, and it just, uh, you know, I, I, I got eight pages of it, and then I, it, I just couldn't do it. I mean, that you know, ever, there was the pandemic, but then ever since then, it's just been rolling crises that we've been going through. Yeah. And, and, you know, it, it, so, so you, you couldn't then exclude all that, you know, you couldn't just write about the quarantine. So it just got very confusing. And then I, I decided since I did have this other work, these review essays I was working on, 
I was happy to, 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 to have that and to do that. But, you know, like, like all these other writers I know, and I'm, I'm sure you too, the idea is that so much is changing and we're changing and we have to wait and see what that, that changes before we can actually write about it. And on the one hand, it feels like, how can I not write about it, mm -hmm. all of it? And on the other hand, it feels like it's too soon to be writing about it. Yeah. So I'm not sure what's going to happen, but I, I don't, uh, you know, I, I, I don't feel ready to jump into, uh, you know, particularly after the failure of this, you know, eight pages. I mean, perhaps I'll go back to it. I don't know, but I don't feel like that right now. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think there's one more I could, um, from Angela, as a teacher, what kind of advice do you give to writers about sharing work to get feedback? Those voices that get into one's head as a result can sometimes disrupt the writing. So when you're teaching, what do you, how do you advise students about that? Well, um, you know, that's the thing about, that's the thing about workshops. I think that that's an important thing to think about. Um, what I, you know, because I myself, I have taken workshops a long time ago, but I, um, I myself do not show my work to anyone until it is finished. I, I, I don't really want that kind of feedback or input. I, for me, I feel, I feel like it would be, um, you know, if the thing isn't finished, that it would just confuse me. Maybe I'm too suggestible or something, or maybe I'm too easily discouraged. I don't know what it is, but since I, you know, I, I finish, and then it goes to an agent, to my agent, to an editor, and then, and only then, and then you know, much later, I uh, you know, friends will be reading it, you know. Um, but my feeling about uh, about sharing your work for feedback, as in a workshop situation, or even just you know, what any, any kind of um, uh, sharing, is that uh, if what if, if what's said about your work confirms some idea that you already had, such as this is okay, but the ending doesn't work, mm -hmm. or this is longer than it should be, or not long enough, or this just this is not engaging, whatever it might be. If you have that sense of it, and then the people you show it to um, agree, well, that's all fine and good. That's work. Then they tell you that, and you realize that you're you, you know that you 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 were right about your own work. But if what people are saying uh, is something that you think is is off, really off, where you're thinking, uh, um, how could they possibly have thought that's what I meant? I, that's, you know, can't they read or, um, you know, like, um, then I say it's like, it's not in your best interest to take that criticism to heart because how can you use something that you don't understand? And then I always think about the wonderful story of Proust. Proust, of all people, taking two volumes of, um, of his work to, um, uh, or, or chapters or whatever, it's, it's part of his, you know, masterwork to Andre Gide, no fool, and a writer himself, uh, and, you know, and, and, and an editor. And uh, Gide read Proust and said, this is not good. This is no, this is no good. Of course, we're not going to publish this. Now, it's true that, to his credit, not that long after that, he realized he was wrong. But my question is, why was he wrong? Mm. And how, why was he so blind? And I think, my goodness, if Andre Gide could be wrong about Marcel Proust, then anybody could be wrong <laughs> about anybody. I mean, it really does shake you up. <laughs> and there are other stories like that. Mm. I, I, I still don't understand why when I first read the great, great, great John Cheever, mm. I didn't think he was any good. I don't know what was wrong with me. And thank goodness, not that, you know, before I got too old, I went back, and he is now, and has been for a very long time, one of the writers that I most admire. But then I very worriedly ask myself, so what was wrong with me? What was I not seeing? What was I, you know? So, anyway. Well, we're we're different at different times in our life, right? We have different capacities, even at a given moment. Like, True. I feel like sometimes, you know, it, you just you're distracted when you pick, you know, who knows, but something doesn't sort of go in in a way it can later. Yeah. It's a great story about Andre G. All right. I think there are some questions that we weren't able to get to, but I think that's the name of the game, but thank you for everyone who asked. Um, and I, I guess, I think what I do is, oh, here's Libby. All right, good. Hi guys, Hi. I'm back. <laughs> Hi. I, that was delightful. Um, 
Sigrid, one of my favorite things to say is going to be relax Beethoven. That's just <laughs> totally <laughs> my favorite catchphrase now. <laughs> Um, thank you both. This was so lovely and so meaningful. I know for so many people that are watching, I'm watching the comments come through. I'm seeing words like joy and wonderful. And I think that, you know, you're both profound writers, but you're also very genuine, real people. Um, and I think it's very refreshing to hear both of your truths. So here comes the bookshop button and you know what to do. Here are the two books. Um, and please, book. it will help you through the month. I tell you, it yes, will help you exactly. through the month. You <laughs> need this book. <laughs> um, so another round of virtual applause for the both of you. Thank you for spending our evening, uh, your evening with us and, uh, be good to each other. Thank, thank you, Libby. You thank you, Sigrid. It was such a pleasure. Thank you, yes, Amy. Time. It was a pleasure for me. Really enjoyed it. Oh, so. Me too. Take care. Good night. <laughs>